I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about what I did uh, before my insurance days. I was a newspaper reporter. I was a, a journalist uh, in my home state of Tennessee. And by the way, it's great to uh, uh, to know about and to see the geographic diversity of the group today. Uh, uh, I grew up in Tennessee and went to the University of Tennessee, decided to become a journalist. And I um, was fortunate enough to be the editor of the student newspaper, got a uh, my first reporting job in Memphis and um, had a string of lucky breaks. I was uh, able to cover local politics in Memphis and then the Tennessee state legislature and governor's office and then ultimately uh, Congress and the White House and uh, the Supreme Court, uh, which obviously is very much in the news this morning. Um, the uh, It was a wonderful career. I learned a lot and uh, I, uh, however, was lured into public relations work. Uh, after my few years in Washington, I returned to Tennessee and joined a political campaign, and that was my entry into communications work. And one uh, offer after another led me to uh, Humana, ultimately. Prior to that, though, I was uh, briefly uh, heading uh, communications for a hospital system in East Tennessee, the uh, Baptist Health System of East Tennessee, which sadly no longer exists. It was absorbed into uh, another company, and that company was absorbed into another, and now there is, you know, so very few or far fewer hospital systems in Knoxville than there were when I was there. Uh, we can touch on the reasons for that in a few minutes. Uh, I was recruited to, to Humana, and I spent four years there. I was uh, primarily responsible initially for supporting the hospital side of the company, and those of you who are uh, most of you on this call probably don't have a clue that Humana used to own and operate hospitals, but that's what it was largely known for when I uh, joined Humana. Uh, a little uh, more of history about Humana. It actually started in life as a nursing home company, and then the, the executives decided they could make more money in the hospital business. And then while I was there, uh, in the late, uh, well, early 90s, uh, the company decided to spin off all those hospitals. And the ultimate buyer was the governor of Florida, uh, Governor Scott. Uh, and uh, I was uh, responsible for communications for Humana as a managed care company, which it is today. Uh, and um, I was recruited from there to Cigna, where I spent uh, many more years. I was there altogether about um, uh, 15 years. And when I left, I was head of corporate communications. I was responsible for financial communications for the company. My name was on all of the earnings reports for Cigna for 10 years. I also had a, an orientation to Washington uh, as head of communications and part of the legal and public affairs division. I was responsible, my team and I were responsible for uh, developing talking points for our lobbyists. And I met uh, on countless occasions with my peers across the industry to develop strategic communications plans uh, that we felt were necessary whenever there was any kind of threat to our company's profits. Uh, this goes back to the Clinton days. I was a part of the effort to make sure that the Clinton health care plan or proposed plan uh, never got off the ground, and we were quite successful. The uh, uh, Clinton plan never even got a final vote in Congress. The uh, administration just folded in the face of uh, intense opposition from companies like mine. Uh, and uh, we spent a good deal of time misinforming the public about what the Clinton plan was all about. Uh, and that was kind of my stock and trade, uh, developing communications plans that all too often involved misleading the public with the intention of protecting profits. Um, in 2007, I uh, had a, 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 the beginning of a crisis of conscience. Uh, there were a series of events that happened that year that uh, uh, made me rethink my career. One was the work that I did to discredit a filmmaker. In 2007, Michael Moore was uh, ready to release his latest film at that time, and it was called Sicko. Initially, we uh, thought that the movie was going to be about the pharmaceutical industry, and we were quite delighted. We, we were hopeful that... Um, uh, the focus would be on drug companies, not on us. But we ultimately found out, obviously, that that was not the case, that he was indeed looking uh, at the insurance industry. 
uh, but not uh, the fact that a lot of Americans did not have insurance, which was certainly uh, uh, something that could have been his focus. Uh, close to 50 million Americans at that time were uninsured, but his focus was on insurance companies and the practices that they have in place that make it more and more difficult for people to get the care that they need. And he interviewed an, a number of patients, some of whom I've gotten to know over the years, uh, who um, uh, had insurance, but for one reason or another, they were not able to get the care that they needed. Uh, in many cases, it took the form of denials of uh, uh, requests from doctors to proceed with treatment or even medications or the refusal to pay claims. Uh, and this was in, again, 2007. It was a crisis back then. Um, the, uh, the fact is we were quite successful in our effort. Yes, SICKO did premiere in June, uh, almost uh, exactly, what, 15, 16 years ago, I guess. 15, yeah, 16 years ago. Uh, but it was not nearly as successful as some of his previous movies. And uh, it did not galvanize a conversation, as Michael Moore and advocates had hoped, in terms of really doing um, uh, the kind of health care reform this country needs. I think it was a useful uh, film. There's no doubt about it. But our job was to discredit Michael Moore, to make sure that people uh, saw him uh, in ways that would um, make them doubt him uh, and to see him as a socialist or someone who is out of step with American thought and that his movie was uh, not uh, an appropriate or accurate portrayal of the U.S. healthcare care system. Uh, just uh, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, um, uh, Michael Moore takes us on a tour of the world. He goes to many countries and uh, provides a glimpse into how those other systems operate and, and uh, put hours in sharp relief to those other systems. And uh, he actually took uh, uh, a, a few patients to Cuba uh, to get the care that they needed because uh, then and now uh, the Cuban healthcare system provides universal coverage. They are under-resourced, but still everybody was uh, able to get care in Cuba at that time. And I think still probably the, that's the case today. Um, I felt pretty good about the work that I had done, um, uh, was doing for um, uh, discrediting Michael Moore. Uh, one of the, the jobs that I had uh, in front of me though, was to uh, attend the premiere of the movie. Now, the first screening of the movie was in Sacramento, California. And I flew out there uh, because I needed to know how Cigna was being portrayed in the movie. And I sat in the back row of a darkened theater in Sacramento near the Capitol as the movie began. And during the movie, um, uh, I could sense a change in me. I knew that uh, this was gonna be a hard uh, movie to discredit because uh, it was abundantly clear to me that Michael Moore had done a very good job fact-checking and that the stories he told were legitimate. And I knew that because some of the stories involved people who were enrolled in Cigna healthcare plans. Um, I uh, knew that it was gonna be difficult uh, and I was gonna be conflicted, but I knew I had my job to do. Uh, and so I, uh, was part of an effort uh, back in Washington to uh, develop a plan to, uh, again, make sure not only that people uh, uh, were suspicious of Michael Moore's motives, but that Democrats in particular on Capitol Hill uh, would not embrace the film. Uh, and we were successful in intimidating enough Democratic members of Congress uh, that it never was discussed very much in Congress. And uh, very few members of Congress on, of either party, certainly no Republicans were there for the premiere of the movie in Washington. So we, you know, we patted ourselves on the back to a certain extent. Uh, we even created a front group called Healthcare America to uh, uh, discredit the movie. It was uh, a lot of resources were thrown at that effort, as you can imagine. Uh, and um, we felt that we had done quite a good job. Uh, the next month, I decided to go visit family in Tennessee where I grew up, and I read in my hometown newspaper about something called a health care expedition that was being held in Wise County, Virginia, which is a small town in the southern Appalachian Mountains in the coal mining section of that part of the world. Uh, it's 50 miles from where I grew up. Uh, I uh, was curious about the event that was being reported on in my hometown newspaper. It was called a healthcare expedition. Uh, call that because it was originally 
the organization that was behind it, Remote Area Medical, came into existence to fly doctors to very remote parts of the world to provide care to people who didn't have access to it. But uh, what happened is that pretty soon, uh, people in U.S. communities began to hear about remote area medical and began asking if if they would bring their expeditions to their communities. Uh, and that started uh, with uh, an expedition in not too far from where I grew up, actually in Northeast Tennessee. Uh, but then it just uh, uh, grew uh, incredibly. Oh, the requests just flooded in to the point that by 2007, the majority of those expeditions, the vast majority, were in the in the U.S., not not abroad, um, not in companies in countries like Haiti. They were in the United States. Uh, I borrowed my dad's car and I drove to Wise County, Virginia. And I've often said that the uh, Highway 23 between Kingsport and Wise, Virginia, was my road to Damascus. It was uh, when I got to uh, the county fairgrounds where this was being held, the Wise County Fairgrounds. I saw. Uh, something I just couldn't imagine having uh, witnessed uh, in the United States. When I walked through the fairground gates, I saw hundreds of people who were lined up uh, waiting patiently in line. Uh, and I uh, and many of them were soaking wet because it had been raining that morning. But these folks were just not uh, going to lose their place in line because of rain. I looked around and I saw that some of those lines led to barns and animal stalls. and. Um, uh, I was just um, stunned. I had no idea that uh, so many people in the area where I grew up were resorting to getting care in barns and animal stalls. And I realized also that what I was doing for a living was making that that scene necessary. Uh, the work that I did was to diminish the importance of people who didn't have health insurance. We persuaded policymakers and a good slice of the public that people who didn't have insurance were that way by choice, that they just were shirking their individual responsibility uh, by not buying insurance. Uh, and uh, we certainly made no mention of the fact that at that time, insurance companies could blackball people. Uh, in other words, declare them uninsurable because of a pre-existing condition. Uh, and a lot of those folks, almost all of them, had some kind of pre-existing condition because they just simply had not been able to get the care that they needed prior to coming to one of these expeditions. Uh, I also learned while I was there that a lot of those folks had health insurance, uh, but they were in plans that didn't have, um, that had high, high deductibles uh, that they could not afford. So they were going without the care that they needed despite having insurance. And a lot of those folks were, were seniors who had Medicare, uh, but Medicare also has a very high deductible uh, and limited benefits. And to this day, uh, traditional Medicare does not have a dental benefit, doesn't have a vision benefit or a hearing benefit. And uh, a majority of the people who come to these expeditions, by the way, are there for dental care. And in particular, people who are older uh, because uh, they just don't have the money to go to the dentist, nor do they have insurance coverage to uh, uh, reduce the cost of getting dental care. And in many cases, dentists just simply don't practice in the areas where they live. Um, the, the other thing that I realized was that had I not been lucky, had my parents not saved a lot, saved as much as they could uh, during my dad's working career, uh, to send me to college, I could have been one of those people in, in, in those lines. And it was clear to me, too, that there could have been people that I grew up with, uh, people I was related to, standing in line, in the rain, waiting to get care in a barn. And it just broke my heart. Uh, it really uh, reinforced my decision to find some other way to earn a living. But that's a hard thing to do. Uh, I... Uh, I went back to work, and as it happened, within a few days, I was having to fly from Philadelphia, where I worked and still live, to Connecticut, where Cygnus Healthcare Operations at that time were based. And I was flying up there on a private jet uh, owned by Cigna or leased by Cigna with a CEO. And uh, I, for the first time, I'd done this many times, but I began to just really observe my surroundings. Uh, we were seated in a luxury uh, private jet on leather seats. Uh, we were served lunch by a Cigna employee who was serving as a flight attendant. 
uh, served us lunch on gold rim china and gave us gold plated uh, flatware to eat it with. And I thought back to just a few days earlier when I'd been uh, in Wise, Virginia, and saw those people standing in those long lines. And that really was another uh, another occasion of a crisis of conscience. But it would take um, a few more months before I would have the ultimate reason and uh, the courage to walk away from that job. In December of 2007, uh, I got a call from a reporter in Los Angeles with a, a, a TV station there who was wanting to know why Cigna was refusing to pay for a liver transplant for a young woman, a 17-year-old girl, actually, who uh, uh, had had leukemia. Uh, treatments had been successful initially, but uh, she had a, a, re uh, a recurrence of, 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 her, of her cancer. Uh, this time, the, the treatments were not as successful. She ultimately needed a liver transplant. Uh, and uh, the doctors uh, at UCLA Medical Center were confident that it would help uh, Nataline survive, that she would have a very good chance of leading uh, a long life uh, if she had the transplant. But a medical director at Cigna uh, in Pittsburgh, 2,500 miles away, reviewed um, the case, which had to be submitted to Cigna for prior authorization. Uh, but this medical director said, in his opinion, he didn't think the transplant was medically appropriate uh, or medically necessary. Uh, this despite the fact that her doctors were uh, making the argument that they felt it was not only appropriate, but life-saving. And um, But still, uh, the, the company wouldn't pay for it. The family decided to make a big stink about this. Uh, they felt that a recourse uh, that they could take would be to try to shame Cigna. Uh, and they began to organize their friends and reach out to nurses. Frankly, uh, the California Nurses Association was uh, uh, was an entity that was crucial in this effort. They uh, began to help organize protest and help the family get publicity. And it became a huge public relations nightmare for Cigna and began getting calls not only from Los Angeles, but from throughout California and then ultimately from throughout the country and internationally. Uh, it was becoming a PR black eye for Cigna. I uh, uh, obviously was having to keep our uh, CEO and others apprised of what was going on. And uh, when CNN was preparing to uh, broadcast live from Cigna's headquarters or regional headquarters in Glendale, California, uh, uh, and to report on the protest that uh, the nurses and the family had organized. Uh, I went to tell the CEO and within a few minutes, uh, he had pulled together a meeting of other executives and the company ultimately decided that day that in that meeting to reverse that denial and cover the transplant for Nataline Sarkeesian. I felt good about that. And my job, of course, was to get word to the family or to help get the word to the family uh, and to alert the news media, uh, secondly, that Cigna was going to pay for the transplant. We got all that accomplished and I felt very good. And I went home that evening feeling that maybe I had helped save the life of someone. You don't really have an opportunity to, to feel that uh, very much in your life. The sad thing is though, that um, the story doesn't have a happy ending. Within five hours after Cigna agreed to pay for that transplant, Nataline passed away. Um, this was just five days before Christmas in 2007. Uh, and, uh, I was just devastated. It was probably the most uh, emotional, uh, high profile case that I had had uh, ever been involved in. And I, I mentioned that because over the course of my career, I handled a lot of what we referred to as high profile cases or uh, cases um, that, well, we call them horror stories, people who had insurance, but were not getting the care that their doctor said they needed because of the decision my company had made. Uh, to refuse to pay for for whatever the doctor was, was recommending. Um, I was so disillusioned with what I was having to do, uh, including putting together a statement for the media that uh, tried to uh, make sure that we were not uh, bending to pressure, that we were not setting a precedent, which was a difficult thing to do. Uh, but I just felt completely disgusted with what, what I was doing. And I thought back 
to my time at Remote Area Medical, that expedition. And I realized that what I was doing for a living was the exact opposite of what I tried to do as a journalist. Uh, as a journalist, I tried uh, uh, every day to make sure that the work that I did uh, never was intending to mislead people, that uh, what I wrote was accurate. Uh, and uh, I realized that what I was doing in the insurance industry was the exact opposite of, the, uh, opposite of that. I was uh, a part of an effort to mislead the entire American public, but in particular, our, um, our elected officials, uh, because we had a lot of profits to protect. This was in 2007. Uh, I did turn in my notice a few weeks after that. Uh, I left the company in early 2008. I uh, didn't have anything lined up to go to. I just knew I couldn't keep doing that. Uh, I couldn't not leave. Uh, and I ultimately became an advocate for reform. I began working behind the scenes because when President Obama was elected, Democrats were more emboldened uh, and were ready to move forward with some kind of significant, we hoped, health care reform. But go back to 2007, just a minute, and uh, actually early 2008, uh, one of, as I said earlier, one of my jobs was to handle financial communications to, uh, uh, to the financial media. Uh, we announced quarterly uh, earnings, uh, obviously every year. And uh, in 2007, Cigna's revenues, uh, the total revenues were 17.6 billion. Last year, uh, the company's revenues were $180.5 billion. The profits for the company in 2007 were about $1.1 billion. Last year, it was over close to $7 billion. So these comp that company alone has become massively bigger than it was in 2007 and 2008. Um, I worked, as I said, behind the scenes, but I was ultimately encouraged by advocates that if I really wanted to make a difference or try to make a difference, I should go public with what I knew and what I had done in my career. Uh, and uh, as it happened, Senator Jay Rockefeller, who at that time was chairing the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, caught wind of me uh, and uh, invited me to testify at a hearing that he was, uh, he was holding on June the 24th of uh, 2009. Uh, I agreed to do it reluctantly because uh, having covered Congress as a reporter and having spent a lot of time in Washington during my career uh, in the insurance business, I knew that I was gonna be facing the uh, possibly hostile audience, uh, but I was willing to do it. And I, in my testimony, kind of tried to pull back the curtains for policymakers to understand how these companies really operate. And uh, some of the things that I said wound up influencing the language that was in the Affordable Care Act, most notably, probably uh, the, the fact that the law uh, prohibits companies from blackballing patients. They no longer could refuse to sell coverage to people because of a pre-existing condition. So that theoretically would help a lot of those folks who were in those long lines in Wise County. Uh, and it uh, uh, made it illegal for companies to drop uh, uh, or cancel policies uh, for their for their enrollees when they got sick, which was also a prevalent practice in the industry at that time. Those were good things. Another thing that was in the law that I felt was important was requiring insurance companies to spend at least 80% of the money they take in in revenues to spend that money on patient care, 85% uh, for large groups of uh, employers and unions that offered uh, health insurance. Uh, and I felt very good about that. Uh, still, it, it was the, the law uh, fell far short of advancing us toward true universal coverage and cost control. There were a lot of people in the healthcare uh, reform movement who were so disillusioned that they said uh, Congress should, the bill should just be killed and Congress should start all over. I was not in that camp at that time because I, I knew how hard it was to get anything through Congress because of the power and influence of big insurance companies and big hospital companies, drug companies, and their trade associations. Um, so I thought, let's 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 
go with this. Let's get this enacted and implemented. Uh, and it would hopefully do a world of good for a lot of people. And it has done a lot of good for a lot of people. I know that there are people alive today uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, because they were at long last able to get health insurance. But as I noted earlier, uh, uh, Cigna has become a massively bigger company since, uh, since then. And one thing that I want to leave you with is that uh, insurance companies are very resilient. They're chameleons. Uh, they uh, uh, are in this business to make money. Uh, that, is their, that is their number one priority. Uh, and more specifically is to reward their shareholders. And these companies uh, have stock that is held by large institutional investors uh, who make enormous sums of money uh, from the way these companies do business. Uh, and so those investors, Wall Street has certainly a big incentive to maintain the status quo in our healthcare system because it makes a lot of money for a few people. Uh, and um, what we have seen uh, since the Affordable Care Act was enacted, again, uh, a lot of people have coverage. One of the people, by the way, in Michael Moore's movie, Sicko, Donna Smith, who has become a good friend of mine, is one of the people who I think, and she would agree, uh, is probably alive today because of the Affordable Care Act. She could not get coverage uh, before because she had been a cancer patient. She was one of the ones who went to Cuba. Uh, when the Affordable Care Act was passed, she was finally able to get health insurance uh, through what is often referred to uh, as the Obamacare marketplace or Obamacare plans. Uh, and she's alive today. Uh, I saw her just a, a few months ago in Denver where she now lives. Uh, but she recognizes too that uh, despite the fact that she's still alive and probably a lot of other people are, are alive today because of that law, uh, a lot of people are not being well served by our healthcare system. And increasingly, I think that is the case. Um, I decided, uh, well, after that testimony, by the way, I um, knew that my life was going to change. I just didn't have any idea how it was going to change. Uh, I got many interviews, uh, a request for interviews and opportunities to write books. I, my first book was called Deadly Spin, which was um, an account of what I used to do in the living, uh, in, in, do for a living in the insurance industry, but also uh, helping people understand how the system became the system that it is. Uh, and also how public relations works, how PR is used to uh, by big companies and their trade associations to protect their profits. And that was you know the world that I lived in for a long time. Since then, we've seen that uh, uh, these companies have become bigger uh, to the point that United Healthcare is now the fifth largest company in the country. Uh, and uh, CVS, which uh, in 2018 bought Aetna, is now the fourth largest company in the country on the Fortune 500 list of, of American companies. Cigna has uh, uh, moved up the ladder from like uh, 60 to number 13. And I think it's just a, a matter of time before Cigna cracks the top 10 and probably ultimately the top five. I mention that because I want you to know that the, these companies, their objective not only is to reward shareholders, but to get bigger and bigger and to control more and more of the healthcare system. When I was at Cigna, the companies grew largely uh, by making acquisitions of smaller competitors. Uh, there were uh, hundreds and hundreds of insurance companies operated when I first started working in healthcare. Uh, over the course of uh, 15 years or so, uh, that began to shrink uh, as companies like Cigna and United and Aetna and others began to acquire their, their smaller competitors. And that enabled these companies to uh, get massive market share uh, and also massive influence in Washington and state capitals. Uh, and we see the results of that uh, as we look at how much money they're making now. Uh, and how much money flows through these companies. There are seven now seven large for-profit health insurance companies. Uh, and in 2022, uh, they had total revenues of $1.25 trillion. Uh, we spend about $4.3 trillion in this country on health care. Uh, uh, it goes up every year. 
Uh, but think of that. Um, uh, over well over a trillion of that flows through just seven companies. Uh, and they use that money, uh, again, to uh, uh, protect their profits. Uh, so much of the money that we pay and pay as uh, people who have private insurance and as taxpayers, a lot of what we pay is skimmed off uh, and is devoted to PR campaigns and lobbying campaigns to protect the interest of those companies. Um, the uh, the companies have uh, grown as much as they th they grew as much as they thought they could from acquiring uh, their smaller competitors. So in recent years, what they've been doing is going into what's referred to as vertical integration. They've been increasingly going into healthcare delivery, uh, uh, and there's a very good chance, folks, that you will wind up working for one of these companies in your career. Uh, already, United Healthcare is the uh, largest employers of physicians in the country. Very few people understand uh, that as United has, has changed and morphed, as I said earlier, these companies are chameleons. Um, they, uh, uh, they take on more and more of the healthcare system. Uh, United Healthcare's uh, division called Optum uh, is extraordinarily profitable. That's the division that uh, employs doctors, but also that owns clinics uh, and uh, many other delivery uh, parts of the delivery system. Uh, the same is true with, with Cigna. One of the biggest areas of growth for these companies came when they began uh, to get more involved in the pharmacy supply chain. Uh, we've, we've seen over the last few years that uh, the uh, supply chain has been consolidated. Uh, and uh, pharmacy benefit management companies have been gobbled up by big insurance companies to the point that uh, Cigna, uh, CVS, and United have an 80% market share uh, in a PBM market share. So they are in the driver's seats to determine uh, which drugs you'll have available to you on their formularies and how much you'll pay for those drugs out of your own pocket before your coverage kicks in. Uh, and that's something that I spend a lot of time trying to educate the public on is how these companies uh, now force us to pay uh, more money than we have in our bank accounts for care and including for medications than our bank accounts will allow. Uh, one of the things that the Affordable Care Act did was establish a maximum ceiling for how much uh, people uh, ha will have to pay out of their own pockets for care, but it's an absurdly high maximum. Uh, this year, for a family policy, the maximum is $18,200. For an individual, it's half that, $9,100. I bet you don't know a lot of folks who have that kind of money lying around in their bank accounts uh, and able to spend that kind of money before their coverage kicks in. And the reason for this, and I was regrettably part of an effort to uh, get everyone on the bandwagon of what we referred to as consumer-directed health plans. We were successful in persuading Americans, uh, particularly our employers and policymakers, that the problem with healthcare in America was that Americans were using too much healthcare and that we were insulated from the true cost of health care. So that, under that premise, began the consumerism movement in which people uh, were uh, herded into high deductible plans. And I say euphemistically or a euphemism because consumer-directed plans was a euphemism for high deductible plans. Uh, it was easier to sell these plans to employers and the public by calling them consumer-directed plans. And we uh, sold the notion that people were clamoring for these kinds of plans, that, that would, these plans would give them more control over their health care. It was, a, it was a, a, a flawed strategy, but one that was very successful, one that was based on a false premise, but one that uh, enabled the industry to move forward with uh, its consumerism strategy to the point that today, the majority of Americans who have uh, health insurance, private health insurance, are in a high deductible plan. And so we've gone from a problem in which Americans uh, in increasingly were uninsured to a system in which uh, Americans are uninsured, or as Forbes magazine last year called them, uh, functionally uninsured. They are paying premiums, often with support from taxpayers through subsidies, 
uh, through subsidies from their employers, uh, but they're on the hook now increasingly for out-of-pockets they just simply cannot afford. Uh, it's been an extraordinarily successful strategy for the industry. Uh, it's one that very few people fully understand or appreciate, but it is a, an enormous problem. Uh, and uh, a lot of the problems that uh, uh, were portrayed in Michael Moore's movie Sicko continue. Not only are people uh, not getting the care that they need because of high deductible plans and going to an early grave, uh, many families also are going bankrupt because uh, if they do decide to get the care that they need, they often find that they are in such financial straits because of the outrageous out-of-pockets they have to pay that they have to file for bankruptcy. Many people lose their homes, and these people have health insurance. Uh, it has become a real crisis in this country, and I say it's, to a large extent, kind of a, a silent crisis or a silent epidemic because people are just not fully aware of uh, what's awaiting them if and when they get sick, and they will get sick at some point or injured and wind up just like so many other Americans before them in uh, in deep debt. The Kaiser um, uh, Kaiser Health News last year uh, did a report uh, and did research showing that 100 million Americans now are uh, have medical debt, uh, and most of those people, the vast majority of those people, have health insurance. Uh, but it can be so crippling that it affects not only uh, individuals and families, but generations of people because they lose wealth. Uh, and once you file for bankruptcy or lose your home, that's not going to affect just you. It's going to affect uh, people down, you know, your, your children, your grandchildren. Uh, and it's just a, an incredible, incredibly awful thing that is happening to Americans. We look abroad and we see uh, countries that uh, have achieved universal coverage and we are nowhere close to it. Uh, the Affordable Care Act did reduce the number of people uh, who were uninsured. Uh, by the time that the ACA passed, about 50 million people uh, did not have health insurance. Uh, that came down to the high 80s. It's creeping back up uh, as states are going through Medicaid redetermination. Uh, more and more people are being kicked off of coverage. So I think you'll see, there's no doubt, you're going to see the number of people without insurance begin to tick up significantly. Um, but as that happens, you're also seeing more and more people who are functionally uninsured. So we've got a, a huge crisis and a big part of the work that advocates need to do now, and to a certain extent are doing, is trying to persuade members of Congress and employers, this is unsustainable. Uh, even employers are beginning to, to realize this. The, there's a group in California called the Pacific Business Group on Health. It's now actually called uh, Purchaser Business Group on Health. Uh, a year or so ago, they did a survey of their membership, which includes the CEOs of the biggest companies in America. Uh, and they did this survey with uh, Kaiser Family Foundation. And uh, about 90% of those CEOs of the biggest companies in America said this system and, and their cost of providing coverage to their employees in particular is just simply unsustainable. And that within five or 10 years, it would become unsustainable. Uh, and they're getting sick of having to shift more and more of the cost of care to their employees. Uh, but that's about the only option that they think is available to them. Uh, they think the government should play some role, but there's no consensus about what the government should do. Uh, so uh, as a consequence, because of that lack of consensus, you're not seeing employers very organized or able to do very much about what's going on. Uh, it's an opportunity for us, and it's an area, it's an audience that I'm very much focused on, the employer community. Um, we've got to get them and others involved, and we've got to rethink the strategy of healthcare advocacy. Uh, this year, the uh, Physicians for National Health Program uh, cel is celebrating its 35th anniversary. It came into existence to support universal health care, to support single-payer health care, Medicare for all. And I would argue that uh, while more people are aware of that advocacy, we've not uh, gotten all that closer to it than we were 35 years ago. Uh, in fact, I would argue that while we were advocating for single-payer health care, uh, we were not paying attention to what my former colleagues were doing, and that was to uh, very steadily uh, begin to 
uh, increasingly privatized the Medicare program this year for the first time. And I saw this coming and I was dreading it. But now more than 50 percent of people who are who are eligible for Medicare are enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, and these plans are operated largely by these for profit insurance companies. The way that they have grown in recent years, the reason that Cigna uh, has uh, is able to report one hundred and eighty billion dollars in revenue uh, in one year alone is because of the way they've uh, reconfigured themselves. Uh, these companies are getting uh, more money in many cases from the government, from the Medicare program or from CMS, from Medicare and Medicaid, because uh, most of these companies, many of these companies also operate the Medicaid programs for states. So they're getting more and more money from public programs to the point that uh, uh, several plans are getting more money from the government than from private payers. And that includes Humana, where I worked. Uh, and Humana is getting so much from government programs that this year, earlier this year, they announced they were getting out of the commercial health insurance space. So they're going to be focusing going forward exclusively on getting more and more revenue from taxpayers uh, and uh, getting more and more of a share of these public programs. Uh, United is pretty much in the same, but United is actually the biggest operator or has more people enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans than any other. They have a sweet deal with uh, AARP uh, that has been a, a, been a gold mine for them in terms of uh, getting people to sign up for Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, and they've been able to do this by misleading the public and obscuring important information. Uh, the advertising that you see for Medicare Advantage plans obscure the fact, never mention the fact that when you are enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan, yes, you might get some uh, discount, some coverage for hearing, dental, and vision, but you also are going to be subject to prior authorization requirements that are largely unknown in traditional Medicare. Uh, uh, prior authorization is what killed Natalene Sarkeesian. That, that story attracted national and international attention, but uh, prior authorization has become even used even more aggressively over the years. Uh, an untold number of people die every year because of decisions made by insurance companies to refuse to pay for needed and life-saving care. But they don't make the headlines, partly because uh, the ranks of reporters have, uh, uh, have diminished as well, too. There's not the function of journalism as the watchdog that it once was when I was in my journalism career. But also, uh, these companies have been able to spend massive amounts of money on lobbying and giving campaign contributions. Uh, and that uh, is essentially protection money to protect their profits. And they give money lavishly to Democrats as well as Republicans. Uh, and that is how these companies have been able to grow and change and morph into the companies they are. Uh, the uh, the the companies today, uh, just to give you an example, when I joined uh, Cigna, Cigna was at that time um, what was referred to as a multi-line insurance company. It sold auto insurance and life insurance and property and casualty insurance, homeowners insurance, had a financial services division. The company saw that the money to be made, the real money was to be made in healthcare. So they got rid of all of those divisions so they could focus exclusively on healthcare. They knew which way, uh, you know, where the money was going to be, because we Americans are spending increasing amounts of money on health care. Uh, over 18% of what we spend in this country on GDP has been on health care. Uh, just this month, we saw a report that uh, in just a few years, I think uh, by 2031, we will be spending 20% of GDP on health care. And uh, I suspect, unless some things happen radically different, we'll be kind of in the same predicament. We'll be spending more for health insurance uh, and enriching these companies, enabling them to grow even bigger than they currently are. Uh, but you're going to see more and more people uh, dying because of the use of prior authorization, dying because they can't afford their coverage. So I want to just paint this picture for you and encourage you all to be advocates as well as as being doctors, uh, being uh, clinicians in healthcare, because we are at, you know, we've, we've said for a long time that uh, we're at a tipping point. In fact, just this, just this week, I got a, uh, an email from a friend of mine 
who's been a longtime advocate in Colorado, and he was asking, are we getting close to a tipping point? And we, there's always been this assumption that uh, the system will just implode uh, and that it will truly become unsustainable. But folks, we've been saying that for decades now. Uh, and I have a book that is uh, from the 1960s that was saying pretty much the same thing. Uh, but here we are in 2023, uh, and we have a situation in which uh, so many Americans with insurance can't use it, and these companies are becoming massively bigger and more powerful. And they, their appetite for acquisitions is un, un, unquenchable. Uh, they want to grow more than anything. Uh, and as I said, in the top five, you've got uh, CVS, which owns Aetna and United Healthcare. Uh, and the only companies in America that are bigger are Apple, Amazon, and Walmart. Uh, and these companies are ambitious enough that, that I think you'll see them rising to the very top. I think it's only a matter of time before you see these companies really at the very top uh, and controlling almost every aspect of our interaction with the healthcare system and profiting from it. We are truly in a crisis situation, and I, uh, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We've made some progress in the work that we're doing right now. When I say we, I lead some nonprofit organizations now, and I write a newsletter. I spend a lot of time in Washington uh, and a lot of time trying to educate the public, but in, in particular, policymakers and employers and the media on just what a crisis we currently are in. Uh, PBMs, as an example, we're finally getting Congress to pay attention to the vast amounts of money that these companies are extracting from the pharmacy supply chain. Uh, insurers, insurers were brilliant in uh, uh, helping to put drug makers on the hot seat. And they, you know, drug makers have been on the hot seat for many years, uh, despite the fact that um, uh, drugs, uh, the cost of drugs or how much we spend on drugs is a relatively small percentage of what we spend overall on healthcare in this country. It's a significant amount of money. There's no doubt about it. And drug companies have high profit margins. Many of them do. Uh, but insurance companies were partly behind the effort to shift the focus of drug companies so that we would be focused on them and paying no attention to what they were doing. Uh, and uh, so as a consequence, uh, health insurers have gone largely uh, without scrutiny for many years uh, since the Affordable Care Act was passed now 14 years ago. And uh, the plight for so many Americans has worsened. Uh, uh, we uh, have experienced, you know, the, the, the pandemic was partly responsible, but not only responsible for, the, for us losing ground when it comes to life expectancy. Uh, people are living uh, shorter lives now, uh, and young people are uh, finding that their their chances of of mobility and uh, having a lifestyle that's better than their parents that's not happening anymore, and partly because we're spending so damn much money on healthcare that is going straight into uh, these big insurance companies and then straight into the pockets of the big shareholders and the top executives of these companies. Congress is uh, beginning to look at PBMs. Uh, and whether these companies should own them in the first place. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is also uh, has launched an inquiry into uh, PBMs. So conceivably, we could see some changes uh, that come out of the FTC. It would be wonderful if, if the FTC would order these companies to be broken up. Uh, I'm skeptical that that will happen because, again, these companies spend so much money uh, to protect their interests in Washington. Um, uh, and uh, the, uh, but they will even try to make sure that Congress doesn't uh, do much that will interfere with their profit making. Uh, but we, we at least have got Congress focused on that and other members of Congress focused on Medicare Advantage. Uh, some Democrats are finally waking up. It's sad to report to you that uh, in years past, even the majority of Democrats have signed on to an insurance industry uh, created letter that circulated among members of Congress to get them to sign on to a letter uh, urging uh, uh, or expressing support for Medicare Advantage and the protection of that program. Even some members of the so-called squad uh, uh, have signed on to that letter in the past. It's just simply outrageous uh, how these companies have been able to uh, uh, influence even members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and, and some members of the, the so-called squad. Uh, this year, 
uh, early in January, I was one of um, uh, three or four uh, advocates who had the chance to make a presentation to the Progressive Caucus in Washington. Uh, and I think we made a, a compelling case that they should not sign that letter. They should instead uh, look to change that program. And if we could undo it, uh, that's going to be too much of a heavy lift, I think. But at least we were successful in uh, persuading Democrats not to sign that letter this year. Uh, and that was a big step forward. Uh, uh, and it was a big blow to the industry. Uh, they were not able to use this as a PR tool. But folks, there's so much work that needs to be done. And I want to encourage you all to be advocates, to keep up with what's going on. I hope you will sign up for my newsletter. It's called Healthcare Uncovered. Uh, it's on the, the Substack platform. Uh, you can find it uh, by searching uh, wendellpotter.substack.com. Uh, sign up for it, it's free. Uh, if you've got the means to help uh, pay for it as a paid subscriber, please do. But I know uh, students don't have much money. I just want more people to see the content that we produce. Uh, and uh, check out our advocacy groups, too. The Center for Health and Democracy is uh, one of the advocacy groups that I lead. It's a nonprofit. There's another one that I lead called Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation. As I said earlier, uh, we're working to try to get uh, business owners and business leaders to start paying attention and to be more active and uh, and also to uh, make sure that we're uh, 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 just making progress and stopping uh, the encroachment of these companies into every corner of healthcare uh, uh, because your livelihoods are at stake and who you will work for is at stake here. So I, I trust that you will uh, be, uh, uh, not only stay ad, uh, involved in advocacy, uh, but continue to devote your time and attention and resources to it and uh, join in efforts to put together, in my view, what is needed, a, a very good strategic overarching plan to uh, reduce the power and influence of these companies. It's fine to keep advocating for Medicare for all, but don't do that to the exclusion of pointing out just the problems that we currently have and how these companies are growing and taking over our healthcare system. I'm gonna end with that and hope that uh, we'll just uh, have a conversation from you know for, for, for now on. I saw someone uh, was asking if uh, there was an audio problem. Can you all hear me okay? okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thank you um, yeah, so much fine. for the talk. It's been very informative. Um, I had a question to start, and then I think we can just keep going from there. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, from the way you see things, on principle, just also the way like the math works out, do you think there even is an ethical way to run an insurance system that is profitable or like is sustainable even? No. But, uh, yeah. Well, uh, here's why I say that so categorically. Um, a few days ago, um, uh, a doctor and researcher at Indiana University, his name is Aaron Carroll, and he writes frequently for the New York Times and other publications, uh, wrote a piece uh, based on a lot of research he had done, uh, once again, doing sort of like what Michael Moore did, looking at other countries and what they've done. Uh, and he points out that Still, these other countries have been able to figure out how to get everyone, how to achieve universal coverage, uh, how to control health care costs. We spend more than twice uh, the amount of money per capita in this country on health care uh, than the average uh, of other countries. Uh, it's just incredible how much money we spend on health care and have so little to, to show for it. Uh, his, I guess his ultimate point was you don't necessarily have to install a single payer healthcare system in the, in the US uh, to achieve universal coverage or cost savings that other countries have had have done things somewhat differently like France and Germany, they're often mentioned in the Netherlands that and Switzerland that permit insurance companies to operate. The thing that, that he doesn't note well enough or even at all uh, is that uh, in those countries that do permit private insurance companies to operate, they're heavily regulated. Uh, uh, they have to offer standardized plans, uh, and uh, they can't operate on a for-profit basis. 
uh, what we have seen happen over the past several years is the conversion of a lot of nonprofit uh, health insurance companies to for-profit status. When I first started working in healthcare, uh, the majority of health insurance companies were still nonprofit, but that has changed. And increasingly, Blue Cross plans are now part of uh, big for-profit companies. Uh, and as I said earlier, their uh, top priority is to make money and reward their shareholders. So I just do not see that it's possible for us to achieve either universal coverage or cost control uh, with these companies uh, running our healthcare system or are just about to run our healthcare system. They're just not motivated to do that. They have little interest in making sure that all Americans are covered or have adequate coverage. Um, Raghu, go ahead. Um, I had a question like regarding reinsurance and like anything that you experienced with Cigna and reinsurance and like how that kind of works and if it's good or it's bad and like what we can do to address that. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was at Cigna, uh, Cigna had a reinsurance division. Uh, uh, but the company decided to sell it and sold it to, I think, Swiss Re. I've forgotten which one it, it sold it to, maybe Chubb. Um, that was several years ago. But reinsurance still is uh, is an important business uh, in insurance uh, and increasingly so in healthcare. It's, it's largely unknown in some other, other countries or at least used in other, other countries. Uh, reinsurance, as you all probably know, uh, is a system in which... Uh, uh, you you buy a separate policy uh, to cover uh, extraordinary expenses, uh, and a lot of employers uh, buy stop loss insurance. Uh, and uh, Cigna, to this day, has a pretty robust stop loss business. But reinsurance is important; it's important for public programs as well, too. Or as companies increasingly are involved in the public programs, uh, uh, it's a shame that it has to exist. But it's uh, it's an important component, regrettably, of our healthcare system, uh, uh, partly because of the inadequacy of standard insurance plans. It, 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 some versions of reinsurance, of stop loss insurance, provide important protections for employers uh, uh, because it only takes one person or one or two people in uh, uh, a given population, uh, a group plan to uh, uh, skew the uh, uh, healthcare cost. Someone who needs very expensive care uh, can result in an employer uh, being on the hook for a lot of money. Uh, and that gives me an opportunity to maybe just note here too, that the way insurance is regulated, most employers are not subject to state regulations. They are protected by uh, a 1974 law called ERISA, E-R-I-S-A. Uh, and um, they, uh, 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 as a consequence, have very lax regulation. The Department of Labor presumably regulates ERISA plans, but the Department of Labor has never been adequately resourced to uh, truly regulate these plans. Uh, so uh, they're exempt from state scrutiny, state regulation, and there's lax regulation at the federal level. Uh, and um, uh, the the employers, like I said, they they know that even the current system is is crumbling, but they're not very much engaged in efforts right now to uh, to find a fix. I do think I will say this: if we can get employers to begin to pay attention and get involved in ways that they haven't been before, that can make a difference. They have inordinate clout on Capitol Hill, uh, and. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, but there's no, I said earlier, there's no consensus among employers uh, as, as how we can move forward. Uh, and the insurance industry is quite able to co-op some organizations that presumably represent businesses like the US Chamber of Commerce, which has been a shill for special interest for many years now. Sydney, go ahead. Um, 
uh, in light of such a powerful testimony that you have, what opposition have you met from your previous colleagues and what have you done to mitigate that? Thanks for that question. I, um, I've been blessed. Uh, I think partly uh, some reasons why the insurance industry and my former employers have, have not been able to shut me down uh, is because uh, two or three things. One, the first time I uh, emerged as a whistleblower was uh, in testimony before a Senate committee. So I was testifying before Congress, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, uh, and uh, But I also, in my career, um, and obviously telling my age, you can see, I, I spent about uh, a half a century working uh, at the intersection of media and politics. So I know uh, how both work fairly well. Uh, and that was, that helped me because I, I knew how to handle media questions. Uh, but the other, I think, most important thing is that I told the truth and I have not disclosed proprietary information, which would, you know, really get me in trouble and be the subject of lawsuits if I did that. I don't have to because there's a lot, enough public information available to paint a pretty grim picture of uh, what has happened with these companies in control. Uh, and uh, I have no interest in uh, uh, providing proprietary information or disclosing proprietary information that would make Cigna less competitive than Aetna. I mean, that's not my objective. My objective is to try to help people understand the entire system. Um, they, you know, they've they certainly made efforts to undermine my effectiveness. Uh, uh, but I don't think I think the the thing that has been uh, uh, the biggest barrier to effectiveness for me has not been opposition or retaliation from the industry. It has been the difficulty in raising money uh, to truly be effective advocates. I think we've done a whole lot with a little bit of money, uh, but in, in healthcare advocacy, there's not nearly enough money uh, to do what needs to be done. Nothing close to what needs to be done to stand up in the face of uh, the enormous amounts of money that, uh, that the insurance companies spend. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go next. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for for talking to us today. I actually um, uh, very much a fan of of your Twitter account. So that was one of the first. Uh, thank you. I think um, Medicare for all exposures I had. Um, no, which is very no. cool. Thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> so it was a very. Yeah, it's a very unique story. I think you still might be the only whistleblower from from a major insurance company. I am, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you for all that you've done. I wanted to ask, kind of, on in referencing, you know, you talked about it being crisis. You know, this tipping point seems to have tipped, um, and we're sort of trying to scramble um, and 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 having access, I think, to Congress in a way that most um, most of us, for example, most advocates organizers don't i'm wondering um did you see what happened at the beginning of the biden presidency as a missed opportunity and i'm specifically referring to moments where members of the squad the congressional progressive caucus anybody in congress who really cared about health care um could have you know for example demanded some bills come to the floor got out of committee whether it was about medicare reach medicare for all you know a number of things um uh, and 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 nobody really sort of used their leverage, um, especially around uh, those must-pass bills and the speakership vote when they had that very small majority in the House, the Democrats. So I'm just wondering, like, do you do you view that as a missed opportunity and kind of moving forward? Um, how might organizations like PNHP, um, you know, move beyond us like a sort of educational lens and into like a um, more strategic direction, I guess. Thank you for that. Um, I think in retrospect, yes, uh, we could say it was a missed opportunity that uh, progressive could have been bolder. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, this, in the, and there, there are, um, I think maybe a record number of members of the Democratic caucus who are part of the Progressive Caucus. It's, it's impressive uh, how, how big that caucus is. 
But like I noted earlier, a lot of them have also been influenced by uh, insurance industry propaganda and pressure. Uh, and um, uh, so there, uh, he, while the Medicare for all bills that Congresswoman um, Pramila Jai Paul leads um, and her co-sponsor is Debbie Dingell from Michigan, uh, you know, they, they introduced or reintroduced the Medicare for all bill with a lot of signatures. Uh, a lot of fanfare around that. Um, noticed a little bit by the national media. On the Senate side, uh, Bernie Sanders reintroduced his bill this year. That you know they had to reintroduce the bills again um, because uh, of change in, in Congress, uh, and they did uh, once again. There were press conferences and events, but those bills are going nowhere. Uh, there just are not enough uh, progressive Democrats who really get it or who are without being influenced uh, to move it forward, which leads to um, uh, something that is an issue that I want to talk to you about, and that is uh, the role of incremental change in, in our healthcare system. Um, a lot of the folks that I'm, uh, I work with uh, in advocacy are uh, hostile to incremental changes. Uh, and see that as an impediment to getting uh, Medicare for all, single payer health care. Uh, I can't be there uh, with them on that on that page. Uh, as much as I would like to see single payer health care enacted, uh, because of what I've just been telling you, the barriers are extraordinarily high. Uh, maybe we've reached a part of the tipping point, but not to the point that we can overcome the industry's opposition to Medicare for all. It's just simply not going to happen during the Biden administration. Uh, Biden himself said he wouldn't sign a Medicare for all bill when he was a candidate. So it's just not going to happen. Um, the uh, Congresswoman Jayapal and others uh, have introduced um, bills that would uh, curtail the power and influence of these big companies in one way or another. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, but there's not very much awareness or support for those kinds of bills. We It's easier for advocates to advocate for uh, Medicare for all. Uh, but it's another matter to uh, get involved in educating the public and lawmakers about just how bad the system has become. We're not necessarily well equipped with the right messages or know about know exactly how to go forward with it or go um, to persuade people to see things from our point of view. Uh, we, uh, what I've observed is that progressives, uh, just as smart as they are, just simply don't get how communications works. Uh, I've, I've observed that a lot of folks just seem to think if you throw out facts and figures about how bad things are, and I've thrown out lots of facts and figures in, in my talk this morning, that uh, uh, people will just uh, uh, get it and line up behind you and become advocates. That just hasn't happened. Uh, we've got to become better messengers. Uh, we've got to be better equipped at talking with, with friends and family members to persuade them to see things from our perspective. And that means you've got to connect with people on an emotional level. Uh, yeah, you can you can have your facts and figures, but uh, uh, wrap them inside uh, some storytelling uh, and make sure that people trust you, see you, and want to uh, be a part of this effort in one way or another. Uh, the other is to rethink the role of incremental change. Uh, what I worry uh, about is that we can continue to see um, 120 members of Congress sign on to the Medicare for all bill, but there are over 300 members of Congress. So that bill is not going to pass. Uh, and you're going to have to get more involved in electing true progressives to Congress before this is ever going to be uh, remotely possible. And we just haven't done, I think, uh, the work or have the have had the resources to, to do that. Uh, Incremental change. Uh, <laughs> once I was asked by a friend um, if I had become an incrementalist, and and, and that was a term that was all it was used uh, derisively. 
uh, and put me on the spot. And I had to deny that I was. Uh, uh, but the, the reality is, I understand politics and I understand our healthcare system in ways that a lot of folks don't from having been an insider and having spent so much time in Washington and state capitals uh, that um, uh, as much as we would like to see a stroke of a pen establishing Medicare for all, it's right now not in the cards. And I don't see uh, the political activism in place that's going to change the polit political that dynamic to make that possible. I do not see the system imploding and people taking to the streets. Uh, Bernie Sanders was quoted at one point as, as saying, uh, you know, where's the revolution? And the problem here is that most people who have insurance, and again, the vast majority of people do in one way or another, but we go day in and day out, year in and year out, relatively healthy without testing the value of our health insurance, without testing the barriers that have been put in place to care until we get sick. Uh, and then we're not able to even advocate for ourselves in many cases, much less for uh, systemic change. Uh, so that works against us. Uh, we got to take our victories as we can. We've got to uh, have as much of a defense as an offense. And when I say offense, I think that advocating for Medicare for all is an offensive play. We want that. But we've also, if we're uh, having an analogy to a football game, we've got to advance the ball. Uh, we've got to score. We've got to put some points on the board. Uh, uh, and more points than the opposite side is putting on the board. And we have not been keeping up. We don't have nearly enough points on the board. Now, I know I've been kind of a Debbie Downer this morning. Uh, and, and I do want to encourage you. It's not all is not lost. But I am counting on you guys. You are a young generation. And I think that you can make a difference. Uh, when I go, when I give talks, uh, when I'm able to do them in, uh, in person, I do see a lot of people who have gray hair like me or not much hair. <laughs> uh, and I do hope that you will be able to bring more people into the fold to help people understand the system. Uh, I do what I do for you all and for you know my grandchildren. I want to try to see what I can do to help create a, a better environment for them to grow up in. Uh, and I want the same for you. And I want you all to be advocates and to be trained to um, as advocates as much as you are clinicians. And I hope that you will will do that and stay steadfast in advocacy and do things maybe differently from what your older peers have done. Uh, you're very, uh, very smart. You 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 know social media in ways that we don't. And thanks for the shout out for my Twitter account. Follow me, please, at at, at Wendell Potter on Twitter, uh, because that is a platform that's been essential for my advocacy. Uh, and I'd love for you to follow me, uh, but not just follow me, be leaders yourselves and uh, uh, take take this on as uh, if not your day job, uh, uh, you know, devote time and resources to it uh, throughout your careers. Uh, uh, your patients will benefit and you will benefit. And I will say this too. You really need to do this because increasingly these insurance companies are interfering in how uh, doctors work. Uh, prior authorization is a big, big problem. Uh, but also uh, people having such high out-of-pockets that uh, uh, they're they're reluctant to come go see the doctor, reluctant or not able to even pick up their prescriptions at the pharmacy counter because of out-of-pockets. That's why I also started a coalition of organizations called Lower Out-of-Pockets Now, uh, and it's loopcoalition.org. Check that out, too. That's incrementalism, folks. That is attacking one part of the system that needs to be fixed. Uh, attacking Medicare advantage is incrementalism. If you would, you know, to 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 be, you know, quite specific, uh, so is uh, trying to do something about PBMs. So please don't let uh, incrementalism be a four-letter word for you all. Uh, I, I I I I know that there are some in the movement who would consider me uh, a heretic in saying that. Uh, it's important to keep. Uh, keep the faith for 
uh, a universal system of health care in which we have a means of controlling health care costs and ensuring that everybody has access to health care. Uh, but we've really got to be, I think, uh, really, really smart in our strategic approach to reform going forward, smarter than we have been. Um, Sam, I also had a follow-up question about how many more progressives you think we need to elect in order to um, get the kind of change in con Congress that we're looking for. Uh, you'll need over uh, 200 uh, in the House. Uh, I'm actually going to spoke. There are more than 400 members. I think what 435 members of the House. Got 100 senators. Uh, uh, you need to have a majority. You will. We will have to have a majority of people who are persuaded to think that the system is um, um, fatally flawed and needs to be fixed one way or another, incrementally or uh, in one fell swoop. Um, but you're just going to have to figure out how can we do that. And the odds are are not all that great. Uh, the other, th The reason the word democracy is in one of my uh, nonprofits, the Center for Health and Democracy. Uh, and the reason my second book was called Nation on the Take, How Big Money Corrupts Our Democracy and What We Can Do About It, is because we have allowed big special interests to call the shots in Washington and state capitals. Uh, uh, we have not been paying enough attention. We've not been putting those points on the board. Uh, we've been able to allow these companies to become massive and the way our uh, political system is run, they run it because of uh, Supreme Court decisions that uh, and, uh, Citizens United that enabled uh, these big companies to spend even more money and in different ways and to uh, spend money, uh, dark money, uh, to uh, uh, without disclosing who's actually uh, providing the funding. Uh, that has has served those companies so well. So, uh, and I'm going to make this uh, an ultimate plea, I guess, uh, reserve some time to get involved in changing our political system to curtail the uh, uh, big money agenda, if you will. Uh, I uh, was a co-producer of a documentary called That Big Money Agenda, and I would encourage you to hunt for it. It's that um, you can go to fixithealthcare.com uh, Fix it, healthcare spelled as one word, dot com. And you can find some of the documentaries that I've uh, been involved in and have co produced. Our, our most recent one is called American Hospitals Healing a Broken System. So uh, here again is a, an example of incremental work that's really important. Uh, hospitals have been consolidating, as I mentioned in the early part of my remarks. Uh, the hospital system I worked for in East Tennessee vanished through uh, being gobbled up by uh, another system and that was gobbled up by yet another system, kind of like Pac-Man. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, take a look at some of those, but uh, those documentaries, but uh, get involved too in good government groups and involved in efforts to reduce the use of big money and reduce the power and influence of these big corporations or we're just cooked. Miranda also had a question. She had her hand up. I don't know if she still wants to ask. Uh, I had a question, but you answered it already. So thank you. Okay. Um, and then Dr. Keller in the chat asked. Um, so specifically in Tennessee, what do you recommend for um, getting progressive elected candidates on board with? Um, like um, she said, to get a majority of progressives, we need some progressives or at least people willing to buck insurance companies and pharma to vote for medical Medicare for all to come from all parts of the country. What do you recommend for making that happen in Tennessee? I almost wrote a piece, and I may yet do it, uh, earlier this year, as you all probably know, the Republicans in the Tennessee state legislature, which I used to cover as I heard earlier a long time ago, uh, expelled. Um, members of the legislature, <laughs> black members, and they were trying to expel uh, a, a, a white woman lawmaker from Knoxville. Uh, all three of them are from Tennessee's biggest cities, Memphis, Nashville, and, and Knoxville. Uh, so there are pockets of blue in Tennessee. Uh, 
But uh, because of gerrymandering, because of money and politics, um, uh, the state is run by a Republican supermajority. Uh, they've been able to gerrymander the districts uh, to uh, reduce the voice of progressives and reduce the voice of minorities in particular. Uh, Memphis is a majority black city, uh, uh, but it doesn't have anywhere close to the representation it should have in Nashville, the state capital. Uh, fortunately, and I'm so grateful for those lawmakers uh, for protesting. I know the protest was over um, 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 a uh, terribly tragic gun incident in in Nashville, uh, but they, you know, they they became well known and defiant, and they uh, the two uh, black legislators who were expelled were were quickly reinstated, uh, reelected. Uh, the uh, Gloria Johnson, the the legislator from Knoxville, escaped uh, being expelled by one vote. Uh, but it gave them, I think, some clout to go through that and all the publicity they got. But but it's not changing the political dynamic in Tennessee and in many other states that have been able to gerrymander uh, state legislative congressional districts to ensure uh, Republican control. It is very anti-democratic. Uh, it, is, it is in defiance of the one man, one vote principle uh, because uh, they're able to give inordinate influence to a few people and uh, disenfranchise so many others. Uh, once again, we're, we're right back and talking about money and politics. The Tennessee legislature is largely uh, so heavily influenced by uh, a, a Koch-funded outfit called Americans for Prosperity. They operate in a number of states, uh, and uh, they've been able to enforce allegiance among Republican members. So you've got to loosen that kind of a grip on lawmakers as well, too. Um, uh, again, we're right back to what I was saying earlier. Please reserve some time and attention to being to focus on uh, changes and that would uh, uh, eliminate gerrymandering, that would reduce the money that's spent uh, through dark money in other ways to influence elections. The, the, there is hope. Uh, a younger generation coming on gives me a great deal of hope. If you all will be really engaged and smart uh, and think differently uh, and act differently uh, than what your older peers have done because we just simply have not gotten the job done. So uh, there's plenty of work to do. And uh, uh, as I said, you all are uh, uh, are savvy uh, and uh, I, I hope you will get involved in both of these movements, movements to improve our healthcare system, but also to change our political system to make it fair again. I mean, my God, just yesterday, the Supreme Court's decision on affirmative action is one more step uh, backwards. That happens, though, in history, folks. I know I've said a lot of negative things and painted a pretty grim picture, but when you look at the whole sweep of history, um, you know, I agree with what Martin Luther King said. The arc of history is, is toward positive change. I'm uh, corrupting what he actually said. But I think that... that uh, change is happening and will happen. I mean, I went to work in Memphis in 1972, actually, I was an intern there, not too long after Dr. King had been assassinated, just a few blocks from where I where I worked. Uh, uh, the results of the civil rights movement have been enormous. Uh, uh, the changes in, in gay rights has been enormous. We've made incredible strides. Uh, in the newsroom in Memphis, when I first went there, it was in an old building, and someone and and uh, someone had uh, uh, not very effectively tried to paint over a sign on one of the uh, bathrooms that said "colored." Uh, as recently as when I began my career, uh, that was still something that you would see, and I witnessed uh, so many people. Uh, who were black and or is people of color being disenfranchised. Uh, we've made strides there. We've certainly made a lot of strides in LGBTQ uh, rights, uh, uh, but not nearly enough. But I do think uh, what we're seeing now, maybe if we're smart about this, and maybe I'll leave this to you all, uh, the, 
the the thing is, I see a lot of what's happening right now is kind of the last gasp by my generation to preserve power and to keep things the way they want it to be, the way that they grew up, uh, to have a uh, uh, white majority uh, rule. And, uh, uh, you know, we essentially have a system of apartheid in many parts of the country. So, uh, but uh, uh, I think young people, even in Tennessee, are going to be voting differently. Some of them will, not all, some will, because if you grow up in a in, in an environment, you will often uh, reflect the same political points of view as the people you grew up with or were surrounded by. But I do think things can change. You often help change that. You need to uh, win over uh, folks in your cohort uh, to uh, see the need to change things for their own benefit. And also to understand one of the things I want to try to begin to help people figure out who are conservative, is that um, giving everyone health care uh, is important, and it's important for them. Health care is not necessarily a zero; it's not a zero sum game. Uh, some game. Uh, you, uh, uh, I think, a lot of folks are worried that if everyone has uh, access to good health care, then that means that I, as a privileged person, might not have it as I want it or need it. Uh, so there is that mentality for a lot of folks who uh, want to cling to the way things are, that they might lose something if more people are uh, brought into coverage and have coverage that's, that's worthwhile. How do you view newsworthy actions like strikes by doctors and nurses to bring incremental changes in the financialization of medicine to the public consciousness? All right, how to be honest here, I, I think they're ineffective. Uh, I've, I've participated in some of them. I think they're okay. Uh, but here's what happens. And I've seen, I've, I've been at some of the PNHP conferences where in Chicago where doctors have gone out and marched and worn their uh, white coats and, you know, made a big ruckus and then went home and no change was, was done. Uh, you need to, I think visibility is important, but I don't know that that visibility does anything, except you can go home and think that you've done something. So, uh, again, think creatively. That ain't doing the trick. Unless you can really, really get massive numbers. If you can, if you can uh, have uh, demonstrations that have thousands of people, uh, uh, that, that makes a difference. But what I have seen usually, uh, is just scores of doctors, hundreds of doctors. The media has changed. You don't get much media coverage of it. So it happens, and it's a bit ephemeral, and no one remembers it. Uh, and those who participate uh, uh, have this thought that they've done something that's that's useful and is moving the needle, and I just don't think it does. As we have seen it so far, uh, I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying not do it, but do it in ways that captures people's attention. Uh, use social media uh, more effectively. Uh, make sure that you are figuring out how to work with the news media uh, and how to use traditional media or how to influence traditional media as well as uh, uh, really making ultimate good use of social media. Can you speak a little bit more to um, the the actions that insurance companies take in terms of convincing um, Democrats, et cetera? The question we have in the chat is, how do insurance companies use stories to move people? Because it seems like advocates are told they need to use personal stories um, and like a narrative format. But what are insurance, are insurance companies using that strategy and or what are the other strategies that insurance companies use um, other to, when they're speaking to elected officials other than just handing them campaign money? Yeah, uh, they have been experts at storytelling. Uh, they've had the benefit of uh, communications professionals advising them along the way. Uh, they, they have tested every word in, in their talking points to make sure that they use the words that resonate. They make uh, uh, ample use of words like freedom and choice and things like that, uh, that uh, they know resonate with Americans. So with regards to knowing how to use language, they've, they've done a very, very good job. And they, they've done a pretty good job of storytelling too. One of the things, by the way, that they've done to 
uh, uh, keep the money flowing into Medicare Advantage plans, we uh, did what we referred to in the industry as granny fly-ins. It's a common thing in Washington for advocacy groups to fly in people to fan out across Capitol Hill and visit their members of Congress and spend a few minutes, usually with a staffer, not usually the member. Uh, but the insurance industry for years has flown in uh, people enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans to tell their lawmakers just how much they love it and uh, uh, essentially put them on notice, don't you dare do anything that would take our managed care, Me Medicare Advantage plans away from us. So they've known that for years. Uh, and uh, again, I left in 2008 uh, and we were doing granny fly-ins back then and you know that they're doing the same thing. So storytelling takes many different forms. Um, uh, I think it is important to stay in the game and certainly understand how to uh, use storytelling, but know that that uh, uh, they know how to do it as well, too, and they've got more money. But it is essential for us to understand language, understand word choice, understand how to connect with someone, as I said earlier, on an emotional level initially. And storytelling is a is an important way to do that. Uh, and um, I, I strongly encourage you all to become more expert at messaging, understanding words that work. I wrote a, even an op-ed for the New York Times in 2020 on how we co-opted co the word choice, particularly in our campaign to scare people away from the Canadian healthcare system. Um, can you speak a little bit to Cigna's negotiations regarding price setting for healthcare costs? I don't know if that's specifically in your wheelhouse. Well, uh, they want absolutely. Uh, insurance companies have been, I think, quite brilliant, and as I said earlier, in pointing the finger of blame at drug companies. Let's use drug companies for for the moment. Uh, and there, right now, is a big feud in Washington. Uh, uh, between pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies and their PBMs. There's a war going on uh, as lawmakers are looking to uh, take up reforms to PBMs. Insurance companies are mounting a very aggressive campaign, spending six figures that they've acknowledged just this year, trying to persuade lawmakers that drug companies are the bad guys. They're the, they're the only entity that is trying to reduce health care costs or drug costs, which is BS, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, these companies would be quite happy to see uh, the government uh, uh, crack down on health care providers that are not part of their world uh, because that enables them to make more money. Uh, so they're very shrewd about this. They uh, they would be quite happy for the government to be more in control of health care uh, and health insurance, I mean, uh, health uh, drug cost, and even do something to reduce the cost of hospital care, for example, because they cannot do it in the way that they're structured. They don't really have the incentive to do that. But if, um, uh, if, if, if things were, were different, uh, if uh, if Congress were to enact more controls, more price controls over pharmaceuticals or crack down more on the hospitals, they would benefit. But in the current system, uh, they they actually benefit as health care costs go up because without uh, even a public option, uh, employers and individuals see these guys as the only game in town for health insurance. Um, and can you speak to um, certain like recent initiatives, for example, Mark Cuban's online pharmacy that was selling that selling generics to individuals? Um, yeah. And like, yeah, how you feel about that? Well, I think it's a I, I applaud him. I think he saw a problem that that nobody else was really trying to solve in making the vast majority of Americans who have who take medications take generics that are really quite expensive. But if you get if you have private insurance, uh, often the lowest cost medications are not on your formulary because of the deals they strike with drug companies. It's really perverse, it's weird. Uh, uh, it's another th game that the PBMs have played to enhance those revenues and the profits that they get. Mark Cuban 
uh, is circumventing the PBM world uh, by offering medications online and through the mail uh, uh, at really cheap prices, cheaper than you can get, even if you have insurance for a lot of medications. I have a Medicare Part D plan, but I don't use it much because of the out-of-pockets I would have to pay for some medications that I can actually buy cheaper from Mark Cuban or some of the smaller, less known competitors. I use a, a smaller, uh, less known competitor called Direx, D-I-R-X, for uh, medications that my, my wife and I use. Uh, good for Mark uh, for doing that. It's, it's good, and it is disrupting uh, the PBM supply chain, if you will, uh, and doing a world of good for a lot of folks. And again, about 30 million of us don't have insurance in the first place. Many of us have crappy insurance uh, and are subjected to the games that PBMs play. So uh, I think that uh, uh, Mark Cuban uh, is doing a good service. I think he's, from what I gather, is creating his own PBM, which I think makes sense because he wants to get more and more uh, involved in working with employers and save them money. I do, by the way, work in the private sector as well, too. I haven't written very much about this, and to say work is not really quite the right word, but I am learning about uh, other companies that are uh, uh, disruptors, if you will, in one way or another. Uh, Mark Cuban certainly is one of them, but there are a number of others. There are, there are even uh, uh, folks that operate what they refer to as transparent and ethical PBMs. Uh, more power to them. I'm going to try to shine some light on on those companies as well too. So there, and I was just last week, uh, maybe it's really no, it's last week at a conference in Washington of uh, uh, so-called disruptors. It was called the Innovation Congress 360, and it comprises. Uh, people who are engaged in one way or another, trying to disrupt and you know change for the good our healthcare system through the uh, private sector. Uh, a lot of these folks are just completely have given up on policymakers and are even hostile to attempts to try to change public policy. Uh, I think you got to do both. You got to focus on public policy, but you got to give a shout out to some of the folks in the private sector who are trying to to reduce the power and influence one way or another of the big incumbent companies. On that note, can you speak a little bit more to like responsible consumerism and like what an individual can do to kind of maintain power in the face of large insurance companies? Uh, consumerism uh, is a tainted term and one that we latched on to uh, in the early days of the uh, movement to get everyone into high deductible plans. I will say this though, and I'm thinking of, of adding this. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. On uh, uh, maybe for the weekend, have a weekend read about individual responsibility because it does indeed play a role. Uh, it's it's been a mantra for Republicans, individual responsibility, and a lot of uh, progressives have seen that as uh, uh, just their talking points uh, and uh, using that to deflect attention away from the need for systemic change. And I get that. But we do, as individuals, uh, have a role to play in becoming better consumers of health care and uh, better stewards of, of our own bodies, uh, how we live, what we eat, uh, how we move, and, and make sure that we're uh, eating less and moving more, to be honest with you, or to be succinct. Uh, we, we, that's very important because Sadly, the people who are uh, most disadvantaged are those who are not equipped with knowledge and information about how to take care of themselves or have access to uh, uh, nutritious food or have the time to cook. Uh, or, you know, so we've got to address all that. We don't spend nearly enough money on public health. Uh, but I think there are some things, despite all of that, that we could do. Uh, to reduce the chances that we will need to be on a high cost medication or be hospitalized. So I think that's important too, to uh, help uh, uh, help people understand that there are things you can do to try to avoid being uh, a victim of our awful healthcare system and die early and uh, go broke. You don't necessarily, some of you may, may not be able to avoid that. But there are some things that we all could do to, I think, reduce the chances that we're going to wind up with a chronic condition uh, or in a, a plan that 
uh, makes us pay so much out of pocket that we go broke or die. Uh, so, so one of the things I've I thought about is having maybe a column a month or uh, every once a month or so that focuses on uh, what we all need to be doing in terms of trying to avoid <laughs> uh, uh, being uh, a victim of this current system, and and that does involve uh, a significant measure of personal responsibility. Yeah, and health literacy too on the part of us future Absolutely. physicians. Yeah, health literacy is so important. One of the the things that I was doing when I left the industry, uh, AHIP, the uh, trade group for insurance companies, one of the trade groups, uh, had a, a health literacy task force, and I was co-chairing that task force when I left. And I did it. I agreed to do it because I felt the intention was good to try to help people understand. Uh, terms and understand the system in ways that they they don't. Uh, it was, but I saw it even then. I came to realize it was just another tool to deflect attention away from them, for them to be seen as good guys, uh, and it was largely devoid of any efforts to help people understand high deductible plans or understand the alphabet soup of insurance, like HMOs and PPOs and uh, deductibles and coinsurance. People don't know what. People don't know those terms. They don't know what a deductible is or a copayment or what coinsurance is. Uh, uh, they're, and, and so when they're subjected to it, when they realize that their policy uh, features all of those bad things, uh, they're, you know, you know, it's too late. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We're a little bit over time, so I'm just going to take this opportunity to ask um, if anyone has any last questions. I think I got to everything in the chat. So the interns have a have another session starting at 11 o'clock, so we should let them go. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for moderating and all, Natasha, and all um, the interns for their um their participation, but they do need to head. Um, but if you have a couple more minutes, I don't mind if we open it up and, and the interns can leave so they can get their bathroom break or whatever, <laughs> or they can hang on. But um, I know that there are a couple other physicians on um, who wanted to see if they had any questions. I have a particular question. Um, so you, you, you mentioned a nonprofit that you're involved with in addition to the business owners for um, transformation. And I'm wondering if you can tell us uh, more about what that other one does and whether there is anything specific you recommend or ask of physicians regarding the one that you do with business leaders. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, even though that's a lesser known nonprofit that I lead, I'm really going to be putting more time and attention uh, within that. Like I said earlier, I think if we can organize uh, enough business leaders to be vocal that can help make a difference and I would love to see physicians work with business leaders they're you know they don't often talk or hang out in the same crowd but I think that would be really really good uh, I'm going to be kind of recasting that by the way that began in life as business leaders for Medicare for all after Bernie Sanders campaign ended uh, the uh, movement uh, for Medicare for all uh, well, it, it you know it, it it diminished, and we had to make an assessment of uh, what we were going to be doing. And while we still support Medicare for all, uh, uh, we wanted to have a name that that was hopefully uh, welcoming enough for enough business leaders to get involved. As you can imagine, a lot of business people um, don't buy into Medicare for all. So we've got to do something in subtle ways to get more people into, into the fold. So we changed the name. We also were advised by our attorneys that we needed to change it anyway because uh, our name contained a bill name. You know, Medicare for All is, a, a, is the name of bills before Congress. And we were told that the IRS might not uh, give us our designation as a nonprofit with that with, a, with that name. So that was a, a compelling reason to change it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's really important. We're we've got five thousand members members in every state. Uh, we're looking to gear up and be more active in California, in particular, because lawmakers there are uh, trying to get a bill passed that would enable the state to get waivers from the federal government 
uh, among other things, to move forward on a state-based single-payer system is seen by some advocates as, an, as a prerequisite and something that you need to do. I want to try to make sure that our group uh, is active in California uh, and can uh, show lawmakers in California and Sacramento that business leaders are stepping up and vocal and want the state to move forward and, and uh, get get more active. So that's that's what we're that's what that group is all about. Uh, check us out at uh, I have to write this down uh, because I always forget the acronym blhct.org org that stands for Business Leaders for Healthcare Transformation. blhct.org is the uh, a website for the business group. Uh, we're going to be uh, 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 doing some work with the board of directors and board of advisors, making some changes, uh, uh, updating the website. And I also want the website to be uh, not just an advocacy group, but also a group that help can actually help inform lawmakers, I mean, uh, business owners, uh, and to help them understand that uh, insurance companies, the, the the signals of the world are not the only game in town. There are really are alternatives uh, for them to uh, uh, make sure that their employees are enrolled in plans that uh, don't screw them uh, nearly as bad as what they are, how they're currently being screwed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jane has their hand up and then Ken. Yeah, thank you. Um, what, could you describe the process why somebody like Ilhan Omar votes for the AHEP or signs the AHEP letter. What, what, I mean, she's not ignorant. I don't think she's beholden to the insurance companies. I don't think she takes money, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, do you have background on that? Yeah, I can tell you why she probably did it, and I get it. Um, uh, Medicare Advantage has a significant uh, share in Minnesota and in her district in particular. And one of the things that Medicare Advantage companies have done in recent years, particularly since the, the uh, government, CMS, uh, uh, created this risk scoring system. Uh, on the surface, it seems like it's a, a, the appropriate thing to do because previously uh, insurance companies did not want to have people with chronic conditions, did not want to have uh, older people if they could avoid it. So their marketing was to younger, healthier, wider people. Uh, but uh, with a risk scoring system, insurance companies now are paid uh, based on what they maintain the health status of their enrollees are. So they get more money for people that they maintain have chronic conditions or need expensive care. Her district in particular uh, uh, has a very high minority uh, population. I think it's uh, over 50 percent minority. I'm not sure. But it's very, very close uh, if it's not. Uh, and uh, insurance companies have had a strategy of uh, uh, enrolling as many people of color as they possibly can. Uh, it's not, in my view, unlike how they how tobacco companies uh, uh, targeted black communities. Uh, so uh, she's in this predicament with a lot of her constituents being enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans, probably telling her that they like it, uh, and. And, and look, when you're in a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, when you're in traditional Medicare, uh, to avoid paying a lot of money out of pocket for needed care, you need to buy a Medicare supplement policy, which can be pretty damn expensive. And a lot of folks, particularly folks of, of color, immigrants, uh, uh, or recent immigrants, people like her constituents, can't afford a Medicare supplement policy. Uh, so they gravitate toward, and they're is easily more easily sold on on Medicare Advantage plans. I think that she, uh, her heart's not in it, but she probably uh, has been influenced by uh, people in her own uh, community. And know this, like I said about those granny fly-ins, you can be absolutely certain that United Healthcare, which is based in in Minnesota, and other companies have figured out how to mobilize, how to activate, how to use her constituents to communicate with her about the, the so-called virtues of Medicare Advantage. That's how I think it works. I don't think that she's accepted, to my knowledge, she's not knowingly accepted uh, donations from uh, insurance companies to their political action committees. That's something, by the way, I'm going to be doing is looking at where these companies are throwing their money. And in the past, they've showered Democrats with money just as much as they have with Republicans, sometimes even more so.
Betty, I think you're muted. Sorry, I was just calling on you. <laughs> oh, well, and the hour is getting late. And thank you very much um, for speaking with the students, uh, uh, Wendell. And by the way, they have seen the American Hospital movie. Oh, good, good, be, good. Their next session at 12 is meeting with the CEO of Dartmouth uh, and to, to as an, a small academic medical center. I, one of the things that intrigued me about the lack of public knowledge is, you know, the public objected to utilities constantly raising prices because of costs in previous decades. And there was an outcry and there was regulation that had to be passed as a consequence. You brought up the fact that, and when we teach the students that insurance companies have as built in to the ACA, this fixed 15 to 20% um, profit, no matter what the cost is, costs go up, yeah. they raise their premiums, yeah. and healthcare dollars go up. Yep. I don't know if a lot, and I guess the question is, in your take on things, do you think Americans recognize this? Or, and do you think that would have any leverage in Congress to say, look, this is what's affecting our GDP. It needs to be uh, acted on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, members of Congress are beginning to uh, take this up. Uh, the insurance companies have, uh, as they so often do, take a lemon and make lemonade out of it. Uh, they, with the uh, medical loss ratio, it was never congressional intent for them to do what they're doing uh, uh, or to necessarily anticipate what they've done. But you're exactly right. With the medical loss ratio uh, in place, they have less incentive to uh, uh, try to reduce uh, healthcare spending because the more costs go up, the more revenue they have, and the better able they are to stay within that 80% or 85% requirement. The other thing, though, that's at that play that a lot of folks don't recognize and that at least one member of Congress that I'm talking with is, is catching on to, and I'll be writing more about it, is that companies like United and Cigna and CVS, Elevans too, but you know the, the very biggest ones that own their PBMs, uh, that have bought more and more companies or entities, uh, get them more and more in the provider side of, of healthcare, they're able to uh, steer their enrollees into their owned entities. Uh, and uh, that's that's also a uh, way that they can circumvent the intent of the medical loss ratio provision. So it's a, they are crafty. But what I have said, uh, and I still say it, uh, the one thing that these companies know how to do is make money. And you can whatever you put in place, they will figure out some way to get around it. And, and, and if it means uh, being, you know, they will continue to be chameleons. I don't I don't see a day in which we're just going to get rid of these companies. They will change uh, considerably. Uh, some names may disappear. Uh, that's a way of American business or any business. But in particular for these companies, they have they've changed their stripes so many times over the years. And even in my own career. Uh, that's what they're going to continue to do because, again, they're beholden to shareholders and walls. When Wall Street talks, people, those executives listen. So I've asked a couple, I have asked a couple of questions. I wanted to see if anybody else has a question before I ask another one. <laughs> Don't see hands going up. So, um, strategically, I have never understood why somebody doesn't bring out lawsuits against insurance companies for practicing medicine without a license or in cases where a doctor does review it, going after them for medical mal malpractice, treating somebody, you know, making decisions about care for somebody in a different state that they've never met. Yeah, I th th that's very, very important. Uh, one of the columns we published uh, just a few weeks ago was uh, based on an interview with a doctor in Arizona. His name is Dr. Dan Hurley. And uh, sadly, Dr. Hurley has cancer. It's a rare cancer, not very good prospects. <clears throat> but he decided to be vocal about uh, uh, his own experience as a patient, uh, but also about his 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 awareness and knowledge of the system and how to how to work it as a doctor how to try to advocate for patients but he's 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 realizing and uh understanding that he's had he's faced uh refusals for coverage and denials uh and so he's uh, 
uh, work to try to figure out is the doctor uh, who has denied a procedure for him uh, uh, the appropriate doctor. And he's finding out increasingly not. Uh, uh, and your point is correct too. These people are actually practicing medicine uh, because they are um, very much involved in the doctor-patient relationship uh, and calling the shots. And so far, uh, no lawsuits have been successful, but it is an area that we really need to focus on. And it may be uh, something that can be accomplished more through legislation and uh, uh, public awareness uh, than litigation. One problem uh, when it comes to litigation is ERISA, because it is extraordinarily hard for anyone to sue an insurance company. Uh, uh, you can sometimes sue in state court if it's not an ERISA, ERISA protected health insurance plan, but there are very few of them. And a small percentage of Americans are enrolled in fully insured plans. Uh, that are not protected by ERISA. So they I'm have confused. enormous legal protections. I'm confused. I'm sorry, but I thought ERISA applied to companies that were self-insuring. It does. Then got like maybe got a secondary insurance. But if you work for a, you know, a company that ha has Blue Cross Blue Shield, they, they have evaluate the companies. One year they use Blue Cross Blue Shield. One year they use something else. They might go back to Blue Cross Blue Shield when they weigh out what will work for their employees and the different plans of the PR person, the uh, uh, HR person, you know, found, right? But are those covered by ERISA? Like, yes, I they are. Know. Most of those are, believe it or not, self-insured. Uh, most group plans uh, are self-insured. Many of them, you know, yeah, there, there are a fair number that are fully insured. But if you look at the uh, earnings reports. Sorry, can you, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but can you explain the difference between, between being fully insured and being okay. self-insured from an employer's yeah. perspective? Yeah. Sorry. A fully insured plan, uh, the the plans individuals buy in the marketplaces, those are fully insured plans. Uh, they're not part of a group plan, but almost all group plans, if you're an employee or if you get your coverage, you're independent of someone who works for a group plan, uh, uh, chances are very high that it's going to be considered uh, a, an ERISA protected plan and uh, not subject to state regulation. Now, there, there are some nuances there, but know that the vast majority of uh, people who get their coverage through uh, their employers, their employers are self-insured. Their employers are the actual insurance agent, if you will, or not agent, but insurer. Uh, and those companies contract with Cigna and Aetna and United to, uh, to manage those benefits. When I was at Cigna, more than 80% of its business was with self-insured companies. That's not uh, very much different at Aetna or United. Uh, Blue Cross plans historically have insured more people in individual and fully insured plans. But in, in a fully insured plan, the insurance company is assuming the risk. So Cigna would be on the hook to cover your, your bills if you are enrolled in a fully insured plan or a marketplace plan. But if you work for a company, chances are that company is self-insured and people don't realize this, but increasingly employers are doing this, even relatively small ones. Most, keep in mind that, that while most people get their coverage through the workplace, over 150 million people, your politicians talk about that all the time, most people are in fairly large companies that are self-insured. Small businesses have thrown in the towel years ago, for the most part, uh, fewer than half of uh, in, uh, businesses with 50 or fewer workers even offer insurance these days because they can't afford it. So increasingly, employers who do offer coverage uh, are bigger than 50 and uh, decide to self-insure because they are finding that they think they could save money that way. And, and they, they are to kind of complete the, uh, the, the circle from what we said before, they also usually, um, uh, buy stop loss insurance because, uh, if there is, um, um, a person, sorry, my phone's calling. I, I gotta, I gotta go shortly, but, but if, uh, um, uh, if 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 an individual employee or a dependent gets really really sick 
uh, you know, we've, we've heard about million dollar babies, but just uh, cancer care uh, is extraordinarily expensive. Uh, and and uh, uh, the claims can be very, very high. Uh, so they often will buy a stop loss policy, which is essentially reinsuring them. Um, if they buy a stop loss policy from Cigna, uh, Cigna charges a premium for that coverage and they can, uh, you know, cover uh, the the large claim cost uh, for those, you know, those rare, those exceptional individuals that have exceptionally high uh, healthcare costs. My mind is blowing a little bit on this one. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I, I may end up writing you an email to try to make sure I am more clear on this because we I think we really need to do education about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we need to figure out what bills need to be written yeah. so that, that is not preventing us from suing them if they are practicing without a license. Right. But I know that you need to go. It, it is like 11. Yeah, well, just, just a couple of things. The Commonwealth Fund provides uh, a lot of research. They do a lot of good work. Uh, they are looking, uh, they're taking up ERISA as something to uh, help inform members of Congress and the public and to do something about ERISA because it's really corrupt uh, or has been used in corrupting ways. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other point I was going to say is uh, read, you know, my first book, Deadly Spin, has a chapter on ERISA uh, and the chapter also on Nedeline Sarkeesian um, uh, pertains to ERISA as well, too, because even though Nataline died, even though she never got that transplant, um, uh, the family could not sue Cigna uh, uh, because there uh, there are legal protections in an ERISA plan that uh, make it almost impossible for someone to be successful in suing, suing the actual entity that refuses to pay for the coverage. Okay, thank you. That helps a great deal because I have been confused for years about why <laughs> the litigation has not happened on that. Right. Um, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's it's hard for even getting a lawyer who knows anything about ERISA, uh, and even if they do, to take it on because the odds of succeeding are so low. Okay, so we we need to change ERISA more than just um, having it not be in the way of single payer. <laughs> Absolutely, a very very important thing to advocate for. Are you familiar of whether there are um, like people working on creating bills that are looking at language for what to pro propose so that I might ask my congressperson to co-sponsor a bill? It, it, I'm not 100% sure. It's a good question. I will see if I can find that out. I doubt it. I doubt that there's uh, very much going on right now. But hopefully with the work the Commonwealth Fund does, it'll shine a light on the abuses of ERISA. Uh, we need to do that. When when the Commonwealth Fund keep keep tabs on what they're doing in this area, because uh, uh, I'm sure that their research and their uh, their white papers on this will be very, very important and influential. And it could be something that that you all can hopefully use as well, too, to advocate for change. It takes something like that to prompt lawmakers to understand something. Uh, what I've learned is that lawmakers' understanding of healthcare is very, very shallow. Very. Uh, so and, you're saying uh, the Congress, having the Commonwealth Fund do the research will raise its visibility for them? Exactly. They're, it's an extraordinarily valuable outfit because of the research that they do. They, they, they don't necessarily advocate. Uh -huh. They do testify before Congress a lot. So in one regard, that is advocacy. But uh -huh. they consider themselves uh, purely research. They don't get involved in, and I know this from having talked with them, I was trying to get some funding for some Medicare for All work in Vermont years ago, uh, and they, they took a pass on it. Uh huh. Yeah, it seems like maybe creating some simple social media, um, explaining some of these really complex things, but in a visually engaging way, because like, journalists don't understand it either. Like how, I can see how journalists would say, yeah, I don't have the time to learn all that to try to report on exactly. it. Exactly. I make that very point in my in that chapter on ERISA, uh, because journalists don't understand it. Their editors don't understand it. If a journalist even goes to the editor and say, I want to write this story about ERISA, they'll say, no, nobody understands that. It's too complex. You'll never be able to explain it. And it's true. And that complexity benefits the industry. But it is something that's so important. we got to fix that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you all. I really appreciate this time. Uh, enjoyed talking with you and uh, uh, keep up the good work. <laughs>